Now, racism never existed on the earth until the 1400s. Never had it. There was no such thing as racism. You had people, for instance, who, who had practiced various forms of discrimination. We even had slavery. But to be enslaved prior to the 1400s was for only three reasons. Either you were a victim of a, of a religious persecution, or you, were, you had some indebtedness and was enslaved, or you were a prisoner of war. Those were the only three reasons you could be enslaved until the 1400s. About 1442, when uh, Magellan, uh, uh, he went around the navigator, Henry the Navigator, rather, went around the coast of Africa and picked up about 16 blacks and brought them back in 1442 and gave them to the Pope as gifts. And those, those slaves worked around the Vatican in Italy from 1442 and about, and about 1488. And it became a good thing to have all these blacks working free around the Vatican and in the Pope's space. No labor to be paid for. <coughs> Other people wanted those advantages. So Pope Pius put out a public edict, Pope Innocent, I'm sorry, Pope Innocent put out a public edict saying, look, if you want some slaves, go get some, but get black folk. He put out a public edict saying, if you're going to enslave anybody, enslave black people. And once that hit, all of a sudden, everybody got interested in getting slaves. And that started the whole movement in 1488 and 1489. Now, something happened very important in 1495. Y'all know what happened in 1495? Allegedly, for this guy who was over here looking for drugs and some other thing, what was his name? Columbus, y'all remember that guy? Now, he came over here, and he supposedly discovered America about seven years after the Pope had put out his edict using blacks as slaves. Now, all of a sudden, he goes back to Europe. Everybody, a race started. All these countries got into a race to develop the Western world that Columbus said he had discovered. And what was the race about? They wanted to colonize and get resources, wealth, gold, silver, and cash crops from the West, and West because they never knew that the Americas existed. There were, people in Europe never knew that there was a North America, Central America, and a South America. They got into a contest to explore it and to find it and profit from it. And, uh, when, and because at that time, prior to that, thank you, sir. Prior to that, the only, the only, can you all hear me as well without this? Which one, which one do you need? Can you, you need this one? Okay. Um, so prior to that time, they had um, Europe all through the 1400s, what they used to call that, was going through what's called the Dark Ages. They, they, Europe was crime-written, impoverished, diseased. And they said, Let's get, they said we, can, we can resuscitate Europe. We can strengthen this continent. And we can find a way to develop the Western world, the Americas. Latin America, Central America, North America, if we can develop that country, we can bring ourselves out of a ditch as, Europe, as an European continent. And so they all said, well, how are we going to do it? They said, we need a labor class. So they all rushed down and picked up the Pope's edict and started grabbing blacks off the west coast of Africa. It was picking those blacks up on average about $25 a piece. And they started setting up, so they want a 1,500 percent return of their money. They started selling them for 400 some dollar piece. And so they started shipping blacks all into this country in Latin America and Central America to put them to work as a labor class. Now the countries that started that, 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 that race, it started with Arabs. Arabs were the first ones that started enslaving black folk. I don't know if you all know that or not. Arabs were, the, Arabs were the first ones that started enslaving black folk, and Arabs have been enslaving black folk now for 1,300 years. Arabs first started enslaving blacks in 765 AD when they marched into Africa in what they called in search of the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. And they tried, and they pursued Africa until the 12th century when Timbuktu, when they overtook Timbuktu and Timbuktu fell, then they started dominating Africa. But the Arabs were the first ones. Portuguese were the second ones. Hispanics were the third ones. 
then the Germans and the Danes, then the French, then the English, the Norwegians, on down the line. Then lastly was the American Indians. Everybody's enslaved black folk. And that's where the race was. A race, a contest started to develop the Western world. The rule was he who gets there first with the most slaves and make the most money will be the most powerful nation on earth. And the race began. Everybody was in the race to use. Everybody's enslaved black folk. And that's where the race was. A race, a contest started to develop the Western world. The rule was he who gets there first with the most slaves and make the most money will be the most powerful nation on earth. And the race began. Everybody was in the race to use black folk except black folk. And began shipping blacks in to America. And they shipped black folk in. <clears throat> they, they justified it initially by saying that it was, a, uh, it was an economic issue. Everybody knew it was an economic issue. It stayed an economic issue all the way from the 1500s up to the 1700s. In the 1700s, when the evangelical movement moved to this country, they switched enslaving black folk to make it a religious issue. Why? Because King James then wrote, when England took over the slave trade as the biggest one, and started leading the slave trades, and started beat, winning the race, King James rewrote the Bible, called the King James Version. <clears throat> and even had, uh, what's his name now, what's, what's the uh, writer? Huh? Shakespeare. Shakespeare and the rest of them writing. All of them wrote, they rewrote the Bible. And they rewrote the Bible, then, they, 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 they were, then since England was the dominating country for slaves, all the slaves, states were mandated to use <coughs> scriptures to justify the enslaving the black people. So religion then became a means of codifying slavery. When the slave owners start teaching black folk, that when, you, when you hear me talk about the white, the master and the slave in the Bible, on earth it's the white man is the master and you're the slave. And you're mandated to do three, three things. One, to accept your station in life. Two, to be humble and obedient. Three, to work hard and don't steal and don't lie. And lastly, to look for pie in the sky after death. And that stayed true up until about 1880. At that time, religion was the justification for slavery. This is important for you now. Slavery then moved from being an economic issue to a religious issue. It stayed a religious issue up until about 1859, again, on the eve of the Civil War. On the eve of the Civil War, a guy named um, uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin, remember Charles Darwin? He wrote, a book, he wrote a book called The Survival of the Species, or The Survival of the Fittest. And what he's been doing, along with a lot of other pseudoscientists, was trying to connect a linkage between the lowest and the highest in life. What he was saying is that is an amoeba that's that small, is it greater or smaller than the elephants that's big? Is a blade of grass lower in the chain than a tree? And they kept making, setting up these vertical systems. They call them genuses and species going from the lowest of everything to the highest. But by that time, the white society had successfully redistributed by 1860 almost 97% of all the wealth and power into the hands of the dominant white society. The race was nearly over by 18. 60 or 1859 when Charles Darwin wrote his book. And they looked around and said, look, there are whites, now let's get to human beings. We worked out the relationship between slave, I mean, but between a, a bush and a tree and an amoeba and an elephant. But look at the black. The black has nothing. He's on the bottom. And the white mass is on the top. He owns and controls everything with all the education. So obviously, the white man must be superior to the black man. And so then, all of a sudden, Racism and the whole issue switched. Slavery and all switched from being, a, from being a religious issue, it became a biological issue. Then, that, then, then, then at, when it became a biological issue, all governments mandated that you must put a person's race on his birth certificate, driver's license, whatever it is. It became a biological issue. But the race was over then. 
When the race was over, they looked around. And since whites had used slavery for so long, whites own everything. Almost 100% of everything, 99 to one half percent belonged to the dominant white society. The slave owned nothing. The white was on top, the black was in a ditch. The race was over. When the race was over and blacks had nothing and whites had everything, the race ended. And what the society did then, they took the word race, R-A-C-E. They scratched the E off the end of race and stuck a suffix called ISM. ISM is a suffix which means keep the prevailing conditions, let nothing change. And that's where racism came from. The race was over. Whites won it, they had everything. They took the E off the end of the word, stuck ISM, that's what racism is. Racism is a competitive relationship starting out to get wealth and resources and power. And but what they teach you now is that racism it has something to do with liking people, getting along with people. That's not racism. And when I ask people, I said, do you know what racism is? They say it's prejudice. You cannot eradicate prejudice. Everybody got a right to be prejudiced. All prejudice is is you got a preconceived judgment or feeling about something based on previous experience. Right now, because of ice cream, I love, love burgundy cherry ice cream. So guess what? I'm prejudiced towards burgundy cherry ice cream. So now when I want some ice cream, I exercise my prejudice. I say, I'm going to get me some ice cream, some burgundy cherry ice cream, because that's what I'm prejudiced for. Now I say, now, where am I going to get it from? I've gotten a lot of ice cream from a lot of stores, half of them worth a quarter. That's what Baskin Robbins had the best. So now I'm biased towards which ice cream parlor? Baskin Robbins. I'm biased to go there to exercise my presence. Now when I get into Baskin Robbins, I'll walk up and down the counter, looking at all the cherry moco, the black chocolate, chocolate rock, peppermint juicy fruit. I look at all that ice cream. And then guess what I'm doing now? Now I am discriminating. I'm discriminating against what kind of ice cream I want to, to, to satisfy my presence. And so I'll pick, and I go down and I say, oh, burgundy cherry, that's it. Now, that, that prejudice, that bias, that discrimination has nothing in the world to do with racism. Don't let people keep tricking you by comparing prejudice and discrimination with racism. That's why all the gays jump and say, well, we're just as bad off as black folk. We're, they're prejudiced against us. That has nothing to do with racism. You tell people, I don't care about your being prejudiced or discriminated, that doesn't bother me as a black person. I'm scared of racism. I'm scared of the fact you're going to own and control everything. That's what you should be working on. So everything you do in this city must go after eradicating racism. Not prejudice, not bigotry, not getting along with people, not bias. You must try to redistribute some wealth and resources back in the hands of black folk as quickly as you can. That's what you need to be working on.